Joining us now is Melissa Murray. She's a professor at New York University School of Law, co-host of the legal podcast, A Must Listen, Strict Scrutiny, and an MSNBC legal analyst. Melissa, it's great to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. This is, I don't understand why this isn't headline news, like across the country, and it is shocking and it is unacceptable if you believe in the independence of the judiciary. How can this be going on? Well, that is the question. Everyone has been talking about the purported leak in the Burwell versus Hobby Lobby decision, but that's not really the story. That's burying the lead. The real story is this coordinated, highly financed campaign to get access to these justices. And actually, they were successful. They yeah. got access to some of the most conservative justices. We don't know if it shaped the outcome in any decision, but we do know that they had unprecedented access. And there's not just this reporting in the New York Times. There was also reporting earlier this year and Rolling Stone and Politico that talked about these individuals going to chambers at the Supreme Court to pray in chambers with some of these justices. This is a highly coordinated campaign. It should be investigated. It's highly unusual. This is the highest court in the land. This should not be happening. That's making decisions for the like, huge decisions that affect millions and millions of Americans with no oversight. And I guess I wonder, you know, the federal judiciary, there is a code of ethics that judges have to comply with. In Congress, there's a code of ethics that members of Congress have to apply with, uh, apply, uh, uh, adhere to. Why, what is the likelihood that any kind of code of ethics can be imposed upon Supreme Court justices. Well, this is part of the institutional design of the Supreme Court, and this is sort of constitutionally ordained. It's meant to be an independent judiciary that's unbiased, unbought by either of the political branches. And for that reason, it sort of stands alone in a lot of ways. So Congress could make rules, but they could never really enforce them. The court itself is a self-policing organism. And the fact that it is self-policing is one of the reasons why this campaign of incredible influence could be so successful because it makes the court permeable and susceptible to these kinds of interests because there's no oversight. What of John Roberts? This is his court. <laughs> I see the smirk on your face. It's not a smirk. <laughs> the smile, the knowing smile. I mean, what happens here? He is the person that is tasked with overseeing this investigation into the leak of the Dobbs opinion, right? Is anything going to happen with that? Is anything going to happen with the news about what happened in Burwell v. Hobby Lobby? I mean, do we have any hope that he cares enough about this to, to actually do the work that he's supposed to be doing? Well, the one thing we know that when the story broke last weekend, that this was really the beginning of John Roberts's horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day. This is the last thing that this chief justice wants. He is a conservative to be sure, but as the chief justice of the United States, he is the institutional steward of this court and he cares deeply about the court's legitimacy. And frankly, this court's legitimacy has been in tatters since yeah. the Dobbs decision. People believe that the court is highly politicized. They believe that the Dobbs decision was not a function of law, but rather a function of the change personnel on this court, that we went in one year from being a 5-4 bare conservative majority to a 6-3 conservative supermajority. And he knows that. So he could not have been happy about this. Whether he can actually take steps to do something, whether he can police this conservative supermajority that he is nominally the head of, that is a different story entirely. We have seen him basically hobbled in the face of these five justices who seem bent on doing what they like and not what the <clears throat> chief justice wants. And when you talk about justices bent on doing what they like, I mean, the impunity with which Justice Alito appears to have been operating, not only this purported alleged leak of the 2014 uh, Hobby Lobby decision, but potentially the Dobbs leak. I mean, I think everybody thinks if there's someone that leaked this thing, it was probably Justice Alito at this point. Do you concur with that? Well, I think... If past is prologue and if the first leak was attributable to Justice Alito, then it stands to reason why people would think he's also responsible for the second link. But I would underscore the leak isn't the problem. The yeah. problem is that this is a justice who said to the Wall Street Journal that merely questioning the Supreme Court's legitimacy crosses a line. But praying in your chambers with people who have real business before the court does not cross a line. That takes incredible cheek to look the people of the United States in the face and say, you can't question this court and you can't question what we do, even though what we're doing crosses so many lines. What do, and when you, when you hear the reporting about what happened in the 2014 Hobby Lobby decision, when we know what happened with Dobbs, do you feel like there are other decisions the court has made that should be revisited to see if anything untoward was happening behind the I mean, again, this campaign of influence, I think, 
puts a question mark over everything. Everything has an asterisk, like who's lobbying the court? We don't know if this campaign of influence was successful in changing the minds of any justices. It seems clear that the justices where they were really successful in getting access to, these were already sort of dyed in the wool conservatives, Justice Thomas, Justice Scalia, Justice Alito. We don't know how much influence it had beyond these three. But the fact that the highest court in the United States is being talked about in this way, that's the problem. The court depends on being understood as legitimate in the eyes of the public. It has no army to enforce its decision. It cannot withhold funding the way Congress can. In order for the court and its decisions to have any force in American life, we have to believe that this is a court that's legitimate. Yeah, and to the, that point exactly, we're not talking just about the mingling at receptions. We're not even talking just about the praying in the justices' chambers. We're talking about trips to Jackson Hole to visit these donors' vacation homes. We're talking about special invitations offered by justices on the Supreme Court to these wealthy donors. I mean, the back and forth between this group of basically wealthy activists and Supreme Court justices during moments in which the Supreme Court is hearing cases that directly influence them and are part of their sort of ideological crusade. I mean, it's just a, such a shocking breach of ethics. The justices have to understand how just destructive that is to the legacy of the court. So it's not even that. I mean, it's not simply that these people are wealthy and they have access, but for most ordinary Americans, the work of the court was incredibly inaccessible until the pandemic when the court began live streaming audio of oral arguments. Otherwise, you had to go down there. You had to wait in line to get in unless you knew the justices and right. they would give you their seats. No one has this kind of access to the court, but these donors did. And that is the part that's really unfortunate. Like for most of us, if you want to influence the court, you write a law review article and hope that someone reads it and they don't. You write an amicus brief and you hope that someone reads it and like wants to cite it. You don't buy a building across the street from the Supreme Court, which is what this reverend did. He raised over $30 million for this purpose of changing the course of American politics. And part of that project was influencing these justices. And to do that, he bought a building yeah. across the street from the court. He got access to court employees. This isn't what ordinary people do if they want to be heard by the court. This is not how justice works, it's I dare not. say. Melissa Murray, professor at NYU School of Law and co-host of the wonderful legal podcast, Strict Scrutiny. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you.